to Screen Slurps, the movie review podcast where we discuss everything that is good, that is bad, and that is savage in the world of cinema. I'm Adam Meisner, and Laura, take me to your master. Oh, wait, that's me. I'm the master. (laughs) I don't think that's something you want to promote. (laughs) (laughs) You know what happens to cult leaders? uh, I I didn't say it like that. I did not say it like that. I'm just saying. You know, um, for those listening to us, this is completely referencing the movie we're (laughs) going to be talking about this week, The Master by Paul Thomas Anderson, directed and written by Paul Thomas Anderson. The Master came out 2012, and we're going to be telling you all about this film, The Master. Laura, do you have anything you'd like to say about The Master before we dive straight into this? Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't think there's anything I want to say before we get going. I mean, because then we'll just get into it and we'll miss like our really important side slurps. So I have mixed feelings about this movie. I'll say that. I I I have to say I concur. You know, <laughs> I I don't know uh, what else to say until we really start really digging into the movie. Yeah. But before we do really start digging into the movie, Laura, you already said it, but I'm going to say it again. We're going to dive into our side slurps. And for those listening for the first time, our side slurps are things that we have been doing this past week other than watching the movie of the week, things that may have been watching other movies, watching TV shows, making artwork, uh, maybe even making breakfast. Who knows? We can do Ooh. all kinds of things. So, Laura, what are some of the side slurps you've been doing this past week? Yeah, so I finished Crying in H Mart, which is the book I had talked about on the last episode. You know, that sounded like you were actually going to a place called H Mart and just crying Well, H Mart the corner. is the grocery store. There is one here in Chicago. We should go oh. sometime. It's like a Korean Asian grocery store. Yeah, I was concerned for a second. Like, you actually went to H Mart. I went to the H Mart and cried. <laughs> no, no. The book crying in h mark okay okay thank you <laughs> thank you for specifying i that. finished reading that yeah memoir by the lead singer of japanese breakfast michelle zauner uh really good it was such a good book uh, the way that she describes her like kind of rocky relationship with her mother and dealing with that when her mother had cancer and died It was just really poignant and it was a really good memoir. So if anyone's looking for something in that realm, I highly suggest. Uh, Also this week, I finished reading. um, Adam has heard me complain about this all day today. It's true. A Touch of Malice, which is the third book in the Hades and Persephone uh, series by Scarlett St. Clair. I thought it was only going to be a trilogy. So I thought this was the last book and I get to the last page and there is a huge cliffhanger and I have to wait two years for the next one. So I am quite upset, but Listen, it- <laughs> I can't imagine hanging onto a cliff for two years, but they're going to do it. OK, I'm going to have to struggle. Right. <laughs> um, I, they're they're not quality but I, I well i take that back because i love them they're smutty it's a smutty book it is smut timber so i'm a lot i mean i can what? read smut whenever i want Smut timber yeah you know how there's like no shave november we have the bookers book talkers book people in the world we have smut timber i'm gonna remember this now for the rest of my life <laughs> so that was my first smutty book of smut timber i love it though it's just a modern retelling of hades and persephone um it's so intense and the way that she like makes um greek mythology modern and in a contemporary society it's just so well done like the world building is so good and obviously you got good smut in it so it you know it's great (laughs) finish that today other than that i did watch the new cinderella movie (laughs) it's not as bad as i was expecting it to be but it was not great Adam walked in on some of it. There there were a few parts that I caught on the new Cinderella movie. And I got to say, I just I was not a big fan. I was not exactly feeling it. And I say that probably because it was made to be so contemporary. Yeah, it was designed to be so present. You know, it's like Moulin Rouge and that the music are covers of like current songs. Right. I enjoyed the way that Moulin Rouge did it, though. I think just not the way Cinderella. I think the way Cinderella did it was just so 
I, I don't know. It was just so poppy and so... Yeah, it is very poppy. Moulin Rouge was at least a little more Broadway musical-esque mm-hmm. and a little more traditional-esque, but also still had a little bit of an edge to it. Right. And the new Cinderella just looked like I turned on MTV and <laughs> it was it was like Cinderella was almost telling me, like, go grab a six pack and your high school friends at the same time. And yeah, <laughs> let's go. I will <laughs> say, though, I did like how they changed some of the plot. So they kind of changed the stepmother and kind of what happens between her and Cinderella. And then obviously they change the relationship of Cinderella and the prince because spoiler alert, she turns down the prince so that she can like start her own business. And the prince eventually realizes he loves her and he gives up the throne to go off with her and her business. So I do like the way they modernize the plot, I think was well done. It was just very cheesy and not in a great way. I will say, though, Billy Porter is one of my favorite human beings on this planet and he can do no wrong. So seeing him as like the fairy godmother was amazing. And he has a beautiful voice and I love him so much. But yeah, so not as not great, but not as bad as I was expecting it to be. And then last thing on my side slurps, just real quick, um, Adam and I actually got to go celebrate two of our really good friends got married last weekend. So congrats to Aubrey and Rashawn. We love you both. <laughs> and <laughs> wedding was a lot of fun. We got to do some dancing, eat some good food, see some friends. Yeah, it was nice. Very, very cool. Yes. Congratulations, Aubrey and Rashawn. And we had a wonderful time. And we look forward to what is yet to come with all of that. As for me, I've got a couple things that I've been doing this past week uh, that really stand out to me. I watched the documentary on Val Kilmer, the new A24 documentary, Val. Um, I forgot we watched that. (laughs) It's up on Amazon Prime right now. You can check that out if you have Amazon Prime. It's streaming for free. And it is a fantastic documentary. Mm -hmm. It is a fantastic look at Val Kilmer's life where he's at right now and what he did up until now really it's kind of a reflection um that val kilmer in his current state uh he he is talking about you know everything that he did up until now and also val kilmer's son is doing a lot of narration Mm -hmm. of what val kilmer was doing in his past life up until now and there's a lot of documentary footage that is used in the film because val kilmer used to uh film himself sort of documentary style he used to always have a camera with with him he explains that in the movie and he would film pretty much everything he did when he was on set when he was acting and things like that it is very very cool it's also very sad to see what val kilmer is going through right now because he has uh throat cancer and he's uh being treated for that so uh my heart goes out to val kilmer i hope he gets better um through treatment uh soon and i hope uh things go very well for him Other than the documentary on Val Kilmer, I recently picked up a copy of the book Slaughterhouse-Five by Kurt Vonnegut, but I also started to read the book Welcome to the Monkey House by Kurt Vonnegut. Lots of Vonnegut. Yeah, if that's any (laughs) indicator of how much of a Kurt Vonnegut fan I am, I just love the books by Kurt Vonnegut. Um, I've only read a handful of them, probably four or five different Kurt Vonnegut books, and he's got a a giant pile of books that he's uh, written in his life, but I want to read them all. And uh, <laughs> you also got a graphic novel version of Slaughterhouse Five this week. I also so got a graphic got novel three, of three Vonnegut Five. books in the last week. <laughs> but Kurt Vonnegut didn't write the graphic novel version. Well, no, but, but it's, yeah. somebody made a graphic novel version of Kurt Vonnegut's book Slaughterhouse Five. So. Yes, I do very much like Kurt Vonnegut's books a lot, and I am very eager to read what Kurt Vonnegut has written, and I've got so much homework on my hands in the Kurt Vonnegut realm, and I'm really (laughs) excited to read everything that Kurt Vonnegut's done. And it's starting right now with me going through Welcome to the Monkey House. I'm going to be rereading Slaughterhouse Five because I have already read Slaughterhouse Five uh, a few years ago, but I'm going to refresh my mind on that one. So uh, I picked up another copy of it. It's worth a reread. Yeah, and I will be going through that again. And then I'm going to read the graphic novel version of it to see how (laughs) someone did that. So I'm very, very excited. And those are probably the biggest things that I did this past week. um, You've also been enjoying that new album, though. 
Oh, yes. Flying Lotus just put out a new album. I hope I pronounce it correctly. Y- Yasuke? Um, something like that. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, it's cl- close enough, I hope. Um, but yes, Flying Lotus's new album. It is absolutely fantastic. And I just pre-ordered the vinyl version of that on Amazon. I'm a, I'm a bad man. Um, it's, a, <laughs> it's a great album. I really like it. I can't stop listening to it. And I can't wait to have a copy of it. Um, no, it is really good. We were both enjoying it while we were reading our books this afternoon so if you are a listener of flying lotus and his music or you have never listened to flying lotus's music uh check out flying lotus uh listeners check out his music it's very very relaxing to listen to actually but it's a really great uh electronic music um very chill music for the most part i i think it's great i highly recommend um he's playing the pitchfork music festival in chicago um right now th- right <laughs> this weekend <laughs> uh tomorrow from when we're recording right now actually oh yeah on sunday yeah the same day as eric Badu and thundercat and thundercat guys if you're not in chicago you're missing out um <laughs> <laughs> anyways that's it for what i've been slurping this past week and it's time that laura and i move into our main topic of this the recording mystery. session the magic Master, the the master of disguise. No, not, <laughs> am I not uh, totally <laughs> enough for the title club? <laughs> Maybe another time, but <laughs> for, <laughs> this time it's Paul Thomas Anderson's time to shine with the master. That's right, the master, starring Joaquin Phoenix, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams, and quite a few other. Yeah, uh, we get a young Rami Malek. That's right. Yeah, we Rami get, Malek. Um, I didn't even know who Rami Malek was when I was watching The Master, but he's got quite a few other films in his highlighting. You uh, didn't know basket. who he was when we were just watching it? Oh, no, no, no. I knew who he was when oh, we were watching it. Oh, you mean the first time it. you the watched it? the first time it. I watched okay, The okay. Master. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I digress. Um, yes, there is quite the cast in this movie. A but young Jesse Plemons? That's true, too. Jesse Plemons, he was another actor. I had no idea who Jesse yeah, Plemons was. Yeah, I wouldn't I have known him if it wasn't for, like, Black Mirror. But we can get into that. <laughs> yeah. So um, there's always a great casting when you're watching a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. I just want to point that out uh, for true. those who may not watch many Paul Thomas Anderson directed films. Just know that when you watch a movie directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, you're going to get a fantastic cast. I yeah. mean, it's just it's just something to know. You always get a fantastic <laughs> I mean, cast. I think of him in the way that he cast very similarly to like Wes Anderson or Martin Scorsese. You know, they all have these all of their movies have big ensemble casts and they use a lot of the same people in their various projects. And it just works. I think, too, doing that because the actors have worked with that specific director multiple times, they know how that director works. Right. And they understand like their process and things. So as they do more and more movies together, it just gets better and better and better. And you see that here with Paul Thomas Anderson. Absolutely. Absolutely. And just to give a brief summary on what the movie The Master is all about, a quick summary on The Master, quote, a naval veteran arrives home from war unsettled and uncertain of his future until he is tantalized by the cause and its charismatic leader, end quote. Now, that was a summary I pulled from IMDb. Um, a very uh, quick, brief summary uh, of the movie, but it's a, it's a nice just recap of what this movie. I mean, that's entails. the basis of it, yeah. Yeah, and um, Joaquin Phoenix is the man who's playing our naval veteran, um, Freddie Quell. F- Freddie Quell, um, what an interesting name. Um, <laughs> but yes, Freddie Quell. Freddie Quell is our naval veteran who's coming home from war. And just from the very start of this film, um, I, I'd like to ask you, Laura, what did you think of Freddie Quell's character, his traits, the way he was acting mm-hmm. um, with his fellow Navy uh, peers and things like that? Yeah, I think Paul Thomas Anderson did a really great job of setting up Freddie's character as someone that's very broken. And you can see that just from the opening when they're it seems it's the end of the war and they're like on a beach waiting to be taken home, essentially. Right. But you see Quell kind of on his own, just walking around, very lonely, you know, touching a sand woman. (laughs) Like He sets it up really well that we see that the war has really affected Freddie Quell. And it's like I said, broken him like he's a broken man. He's really struggling with 
how he's going to continue his life now, you know, after the things that he saw during the war. So I did like that. I feel like in that first there wasn't even any lines. It was just like an opening montage. But through that, we were he was really able to establish like Freddie's character. And Freddie Quell, the main things that it seemed to be highlighting with him in the beginning was that not only is his character broken uh, just as a person necessarily, um, but he's broken, uh, <laughs> to be blunt, he's broken um, sexually. And he's trying well, to... Well, he's been at he's, war he's, and he's not to, had a woman. That's so. <laughs> true. And he's trying to he's trying to jerk off into the ocean. Um, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> yeah. Um, these are all things that he he's also talking to his friends about women and things like that. Um, all his friends being men, by the way, because there are no women around him at this time. Um, he he must be really, uh, really just dying to be with some some kind of lady. <laughs> and when those opportunities arise in the scenes where he's by women and things like that, those are the kinds of actions he's trying to take, like anything he can to just try and get some woman to be with him. Well, everyone wants connection in life. And he's been in a war and seen death and not any women. You know, it makes sense, I feel like. I I mean, uh, it's it's an arguable point at the same time. I, I just see that, like, watching this movie, it seemed like it came across very... Uh, perverse a little bit you know well yeah oh yeah no 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 i mean he's like extremely perverse like there's other men in this movie that seem like okay they can go off and you know maybe they're thinking perverted thoughts but they they can control themselves he on the other hand is like no like i very bluntly need to be like humping this sand woman in front of everybody it's like okay man like (laughs) you control yourself yeah i think another interesting thing too that kind of leads to setting up or establishing freddie's character is the way that joaquin phoenix played him as well so you can tell he like hunches his back and has like a weird gait when he's walking um he lost a lot of weight also i read for the movie so kind of like getting into the mindset of who this character is and he also had his dentist put like metal plates in his mouth so he would do that you notice that the character kind of talks out the side of his mouth um Mm -hmm. so the one side looks like it's a little sloop like droopy yeah and yeah he had his dentist put like metal plates in his mouth so he would talk like that very interesting and that all kind of adds to i mean joaquin phoenix's acting is great in this movie he really makes the character who he is yeah it's true i mean i feel like this is a a true uh testament to method acting Mm -hmm. and really getting into character there are some actors i think uh in our society today that really stand out for method acting and uh well paul thomas anderson kind of compared it to daniel day lewis in his method acting that he has you know because he's also been in some pta movies yeah I mean, I think Joaquin Phoenix and Daniel Day Lewis, <laughs> they even look very similar, I think. So oh, they have similarities a little, too. I mean, and the other really famous method actor of like our time, right, is Christian Bale. Like he's for another sure. one. They all kind of and they're all great actors. So it works for him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so as this movie continues on in through the introduction, you know, it starts with Joaquin Phoenix's character. He's perverted. He's a little strange. I mean, he's a very little strange. He's very, <laughs> very strange. I shouldn't just say a little. He is extremely strange. And it's all about trying to learn who is this character? What is his motive? And that's probably the biggest thing to try and take away. What is his motive? Yeah. And you're going to be thinking about I that for a long time. I don't think he does have one in the beginning, honestly. He's a drifter, right? Exactly. Coming home from the war. I don't think he does have a motive. That's why he was just kind of like moving through life until he met... Um, Lancaster Dodd, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character. Right. It starts with him being, you know, a little perverted and moving along. He ends up working as a photographer. He loses that job by getting in a fight with one of his clients. (laughs) Then he becomes, you know, a farmer. He ends up offering a man some homemade moonshine, which we learn as we watch the movie. He's all about making his own moonshine very strange ways that he makes that moonshine by the way (laughs) but we'll get into a little bit more detail with that as we go along but he makes his own moonshine he offers it to an older man who works with him on the farm that ends up killing the man well i don't know if he's 
does he die or he's just like close to dying? Either way, he almost dies or dies. And then he leaves that job and ends up on a boat with the next uh, main actor, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who's a huge part of this movie. Mm -hmm. And his character, Lancaster Dodd. I want to say... As soon as I saw Philip Seymour Hoffman, I remember I turned to you and I was like, is this about a cult? (laughs) I got got really excited because I love cults, (laughs) not love them to be part of them. I love watching documentaries about them because they're so interesting. And I could just tell from the first conversation that Freddie and Lancaster Dodd had, I was like, oh. This is going to be about a cult. <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything as soon as you no, said No, you didn't that. answer me, which is good. But <laughs> Yeah, it, you asking that if this was going to be about a cult, I was not going to make any sort of comment like, oh, yeah, it's about a cult. And they never they never actually say that they are or are not a cult. And it's not like they're going to confirm that they are a cult. However, well, no, but they do later on when the guy confronts them. He he essentially calls them a cult. And that's when Lancaster like yells and he's like, big fuck. Yeah. He's like saying they're not a cult, which is what cults do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they do seem very culty. They, well, they are. I mean, should we talk about like the big elephant in the room? This movie is essentially based off of Scientology and its founder, L. Ron Hubbard. So Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is L. Ron Hubbard, who has created Scientology. And I mean, look at the... Look at the similarities like Philip Seymour Hoffman looks like L. Ron Hubbard, first of all. Second of all, it's the same time frame of when like Scientology began. There's a lot of emphasis about the boat, right? The yacht in the beginning of the movie. And Scientology uses a lot of Navy terms and like structure and things like that in its in its organization. And then the whole idea of Scientology is that you live multiple lives and through auditing this like weird thing you do you're able to reconnect to your past lives which is exactly what lancaster dodd does for the cause his you know he like gets people into a trance or something and has them reconnect with their past lives like this movie was heavily inspired by scientology but paul thomas anderson has said that this isn't just about l ron hubbard well, it no wasn't, no it no it wasn't just inspired by l ron hubbard he said that he's also pulled from numerous other things to right help but you can't this movie you can't say that it's not like this is i think it's i think he's saying that so the scientists scientologists don't come for him <laughs> like it is very strongly related to Scientology. he has said that there is some inspiration from l yeah, ron okay. hubbard but he <laughs> has also stated that he is pulling inspiration from other things um i did pull a statement here that has said unsure of the direction the script would take anderson began writing the master as a collection of disparate scenes rather than one coherent outline mm-hmm. He combined unused scenes from early drafts of There Will Be Blood, elements from life stories of John Steinbeck and L. Ron Hubbard, and from the novel V by Thomas Pynchon, and stories Jason Roberts had told him on the set of Magnolia about his drinking days in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Yeah, so that last one is where he got the ideas for the moonshine that, like, Freddie Quell makes, because the... um, Jason Robards was telling him like, yeah, we used to take gas out of the, you know, the bombs and drink it. Like, that's how we made our moonshine, which is what we see in the movie, too. You see Freddie Quell draining like a bomb. That is absolutely disgusting. I don't know how these people lived. Yeah. <laughs> like, I feel like that's straight that poison. That is absolutely disgusting. Die. Drinking gas for yeah. alcohol. Yeah. Um, I, One more thing about Scientology and then we can move on. Uh, Paul Thomas Anderson is friends with Tom Cruise and showed the movie to Tom Cruise. And I guess Cruise was like a little upset about some parts because obviously it's very relatable to Scientology. And other members of the Scientology church like did see the film and had issues with parts of it, just of how it like paralleled to L. Ron Hubbard and his life. And so, but Paul Thomas Anderson was like, I don't care if you don't like it, I'm keeping it. (laughs) So he didn't remove like any scenes. The true motives of a filmmaker. Yeah, he was like, I don't care what you say, I'm doing what I want. (laughs) (laughs) I'm an artist. Yeah, I but like you said, I agree. What I'm saying is the movie's heavily inspired by Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard, but that's really not what this movie is about. This movie, at its heart, is about a relationship between these two men. 
whether you're seeing some people may see it as like a homoerotic relationship or whether you're just seeing that as like a master and his follower relationship however you perceive it like at the heart of it this movie is just an analysis of the relationship between these two characters i never quite saw it that way when i first watched this movie i even had a hard time seeing that when i watched this recently because it had been so long since I'd watched The Master between the first time I watched this movie and watching it now. Mm -hmm. I think the first time I watched this movie was when it first came out in 2012. Which is almost like 10 years ago. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) So watching it again now, it was like a completely new refresh again. Mm -hmm. And watching it now, it was again, like my interpretation of it was me trying to understand what is this movie trying to get across to, to me? And like, what is Freddie Quell's character? Like, what is his motive? What is yeah. uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character trying to tell me? And I was just really trying to connect the dots on everything. Mm-hmm. And as I started to research everything, that's when it all started to kind of click in my head that, oh, this could be about them having a relationship or the attempt for them trying to make uh, a relationship between each other. Well, I don't even mean so much a relate. Like some people do see it as like a, a homoerotic relationship, but I mean, even it, just it doesn't as even a necessarily friendship. have to be that. But yeah, yes, I'm saying like a friendship. even just the two of them as a friendship. I think you definitely see that the way that Lancaster Dodd kind of like experiments on Freddy, right? He puts him through all these different kind of pieces of the cause and kind of uses him to see how he reacts to these different things that he's trying. Uh, You know, like that one scene where he just has him walk back and forth between the wall and the window. You know, like there's no purpose to that, right? He's just trying to see how that back and forth and thinking how that affects Freddy and the outcome of it, right? right? So it's kind of like, like I said, a master, which he is the master and his subject who he's doing all these little tests on to kind of grow his ideology. Right. And I mean, he can do it on Freddy because they're they're good friends. They work well together and he's working it. He's working his tests on Freddy mm-hmm. because it works best on him as they are good friends. Well, and Freddy like idealizes Dodd. Exactly. You know, he sees him as this great leader and follows him like a little puppy, you know, and which is the whole point of cult leaders, right? They're very charismatic and they get people to follow them no matter what they're saying. Like think about Nexium or Scientology or, you know, FLDS, like all these cults have very charismatic leaders who are able to not brainwash, but, you know, talk their followers into doing crazy things, which is what we see here. Makes me think of uh, the uh, mascot for Cocoa Puffs, but I. (laughs) (laughs) Why? Well, you're saying charismatic leaders, and I'm just thinking of. uh, Do you instantly think of the Cocoa (laughs) Puff? Yeah, I don't know. The bird, you know, just. He's very charismatic to you. He's very charismatic. (laughs) You're silly. (laughs) (laughs) I spit my drink on the microphone. (laughs) <laughs> um, talking about so the beginning when Freddie and Dodd meet Freddie sneaks onto his boat and that's how they meet right did you know that that boat was actually FDR's presidential yacht I had no idea about that yeah I had no idea that's fun <laughs> Well, that would be cool. I mean, uh, it's not cool to have a cult on FDR's yacht. Let me tell well, you that. No, but, but no. it's cool to be like, I was on FDR's yacht. I would be very happy to be a part of that. Yes. <laughs> I mean, uh, can you imagine the permissions to use FDR's yacht? Though, well, I think it's the... been I'm sure it's been sold and whatnot. Like probably it's just somebody's private yacht now. But at one time it was FDR's. I will say, though, my favorite scene of this entire movie, just to put this out there was when Lancaster Dodd was questioning Freddie Quell. That was probably the most memorable scene I had from this entire movie from the first time that I watched this movie. That was probably the one scene that has made me just keep this movie in my mind as a movie that I would want to go back to as one of Paul Thomas Anderson's films to remember. You mean the one in the beginning on the boat when he's like, don't blink or we have to start over? Yes. Yeah. No, that was a very intense scene. 
I can I can't imagine filming that scene. I feel like that would be hard to do. But they're both very um legit actors, so I'm sure they took it seriously. Yeah, that particular scene when I saw this movie in theaters, that was the scene when I was watching this movie and the entire introduction up until that point, I was thinking to myself, what is going on with this movie? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. What are these characters? And then that scene happened and immediately I sat on the edge of my chair for the rest of the film like, oh, man, this movie means something. (laughs) Yeah. Um, One of my actually, I'd say my favorite scene is so later on, Freddie joins the cause right and so the big part of this movie is just seeing the relationship between the two of them and kind of the cause growing and Lancaster Dodd as its leader and whatnot he kind of travels around and holds these like exhibitions to get people to join or whatnot but they're in one city and Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is arrested by the police for you know He's essentially being charged for, like, practicing medicine without having a license. I think that's what it was, uh, which also happened in Scientology. So another comparison. But anywho, and as the police are taking away Lancaster Dodd, Freddie Quell freaks out, right, and starts fighting the police. So he's also taken in. So one of my favorite parts of this movie is actually the scene where they're both in jail and they're in those scenes next to each other. And Freddie is freaking out. Like, he's so upset with Lancaster Dodd this is when he kind of falls apart with him right and it's like they're both yelling at each other but they're both screaming and it's just a lot of tension between the two of them and i thought that scene was done really really well and i know i was reading and joaquin phoenix actually improvised for a lot of this movie and they were saying one of the big scenes is that scene so you know how he like kicks and breaks that toilet that was not supposed to happen and they were on like a historical site and that was i think he got in trouble for breaking that toilet because it's like a historical site or whatever but yeah so i like reading that after seeing the scene i'm like well it adds a sense of realness to it right like that he that wasn't supposed to happen it just did that is unfortunate and yeah as i was reading about that too i read that it wasn't he wasn't supposed to break the toilet i mean he didn't intend to break the toilet no yeah i don't think he was like i'm gonna smash this ancient he was just angry and he didn't mean to actually break that toilet but it just happened and they kept rolling Mm -hmm. the scene so Mm -hmm. And I I think another character we should talk about, because I think her character is very interesting, is Amy Adams, who plays Philip Seymour Hoffman's wife. And I think what's so interesting about her is kind of we get these undertones throughout the movie that it seems like she's actually the one wearing the pants. Right. She it seems like she's actually the one controlling things from the backside. And Lancaster Dodd is kind of like the face Of the movement, but really she's in the back, like, pulling strings. That's the vibe I got, at least. Yeah, I agree. I really was not sure what her character was doing the entire time. I mean, she clearly had a big play in this because she was also part of the movement. And she had a very strong part of the movement because Mm -hmm. there would be scenes showing she was also teaching things as part of the movement. Lancaster Dodd would be teaching in some form. She would be teaching in some form to Mm -hmm. Freddie Quell. And so there was this counterbalance between the two of them. And then there would be scenes where she would be talking with Lancaster Dodd about how she felt things should be going along and how she felt that Freddie Quell was, you know, intervening the wrong way. Right. And she felt he was interrupting in ways that he shouldn't be. Well, yeah, because she wanted Freddie out at times. Exactly. And that's where we get that really crazy scene, too, where um, Lancaster Dodd is in the bathroom and she comes up and starts giving him a hand job. Right. And she's like, you only come for me where she's, you know, she's pretty much stating right then and there, like, I make the rules. You, you know, I am the decision maker. You do what I say. And he's like, yes, yes. Okay. And I feel like at the very end too, when they're in England, it's, and Freddie goes to see them. It seems like she is very much in control still. That's the vibe I got at least. It's, it's very, very interesting to see. And I still think even after watching it, I'm not entirely 100% sure what kind of control she had or mm-hmm. i'm not 100 percent sure on her character i don't know anything about this movie after watching it <laughs> like what is that's how i said earlier i have mixed feelings about it i think the acting was great 
There's parts of it I really like. But at the end of the day, I'm like, what was this movie trying to say? Is this trying to be an, like a look on cults? Is this trying to be a look on a relationship between these two men? Is it trying to be a look at post-war society? Like, I feel like there's so many things in this movie, but it doesn't actually have a thesis. I think I think we already made the point of what this movie is a look at. A lot of people, I think, are not going to catch it. And maybe they can disagree with me or they can agree with me. But I think this movie is a look at the Freddie Quell Lancaster Dodd connection. And I will make that uh, assessment because near the end of this film, it is pretty much the end of this film, but near the end of this film, after everything has progressed and you have that connection between Lancaster Dodd and Freddie Quell, the off and on connection. I mean, they are together for most of the entire film and you see them have their ups and downs. And near the end of the film, after Freddie Quell is not with Lancaster Dodd, he, he has a moment where he's in a movie theater by himself. He's watching a movie. He's upset because he can't get back together with a girl that he had promised he would come back to and choose to marry. However, that didn't happen. So in his attempt to try and go back to her house and try and see her. And I guess this is his attempt now to see if he can talk to her. He learns that she is married to somebody else. And I believe she has kids now. Mm -hmm. And her mother is telling this to Freddie Quell. And so he tells her mother, you know, well, nice talking to you. Great to see you. And, you know, um, (laughs) I'll be on my way. I'll be on my way. Well, he does say, like, tell her I'm happy for her. Yeah. Tell her I'm happy for her. And he goes to a movie theater now and he's just very sad in the movie theater. And I believe he was crying in the movie theater. I think he was um, sleeping. <laughs> oh, sleeping? I think he was asleep. Well, he's in the movie theater and he's upset. He gets a phone call in the movie theater from Lancaster Dodd. And he's wondering how Lancaster even found him in the movie theater. But I don't think they really have a resolution for that. But Lancaster Dodd tells him to go visit him in England and meet up with him and talk with him in England which Freddie Quell actually does. He goes to England to talk with Lancaster Dodd, and they have this meetup in England. We learn now that Lancaster Dodd's um, what we will call a cult. Uh, it, <laughs> it's, it's a cult. It is essentially a cult. It's a cult. <laughs> um, it has grown immensely in England now. It is essentially an academy in England for the most part. It is just this giant uh, situation. But Freddie Quell goes there. He goes to meet with Lancaster Dodd. He's in a room with him uh, one-on-one. They're sitting together. And here's the point that I want to make is that they're talking with one another. And Lancaster Dodd actually tells Freddie, and this is in relation to the very beginning of the film, actually. Lancaster Dodd tells Freddie in the beginning of the movie that he believes that, um, like, he asks Freddie, have they met before? Mm -hmm. He believes that they have met before. Right. And in the end of the movie, Lancaster tells Freddie that they have met before, that they used to work together in Paris, um, doing something with balloons. Well, that's in a, so in a past life, right? Because... The ideology behind the cause is that people have lived multiple lives. You, you reincarnate. So he, yeah, he says that we knew each other in a past life and we worked in Paris together. So that's... That- but what is that trying to say about their relationship? That's my whole point, you know? It's like, there's all these things this movie could be about, but I feel like it's not actually saying anything. And then he starts, Lancaster Dodd begins to sing to Freddie Quell, uh on a steamboat in China or yeah, I think that's what it was Yeah, on a steamboat in China. Lancaster Dodd singing on a steamboat in China to Freddie Quell. And he's also telling him that, um, he can either stay here with him in England or he can leave and never come back and never see him again. Right. And Freddie decides to leave. I mean, so are we saying then maybe the movie is about Freddie's growth? I mean, because you do see at the end how he says he's happy for the woman that he loved who's moved on and he decides he doesn't need Lancaster Dodd anymore. He can be his own man. So maybe then the point of the movie is Freddie Quell fixing himself. 
I mean, essentially, if we want to look at even deeper, a metaphorical kind of look at this, Lancaster Dodd helped fix Freddy and helped teach him yeah. how to grow. And then in the end, it's as if Lancaster Dodd didn't grow, but Freddy learned how to grow. Yeah, and he just lets him go. No, that is an interesting... I didn't think of that before, but looking at the movie as kind of just like the development of Freddy on his own, that is an interesting take on it. I do have a question for you, though, Adam. I noticed a few things. Do you think this movie was all imagined? Like, it's all in Freddy Quell's mind? Because let me... I have two, two points of evidence for this. So as we said in the very beginning of the movie, we see Freddy Quell humping a sand woman. We see that same scene at the very end of the movie as well. So that comes back to that. So was this all in between just in his mind? Like him and that, like trying to fix himself through this subconscious world he creates? Like what, what, why would they bring back the humping of the sand woman at the end again? That is a very good point. And why would he go back to the sand woman? Right. Like, or is it, is it the exact same sand woman? It looked very similar. Like, like why would they bring that back? As soon as I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, did any of this happen? And then I also found some, I don't know if this was just a continuity error or something, but the scene where he's in the movie theater, so he's sitting there, he's asleep. He wakes up and he's talking on the phone with Dodd and then like it cuts and he's back asleep again without a phone. So like was the phone call imagined? But if the whole thing's imagined, why would he then imagine one scene? Like I thought that scene in particular was really interesting. I'll have to show you again maybe. Like one second he's on the phone with Dodd, the next second he's asleep and he wakes back up. I yeah, I'm really not sure about that one. This is me creating conspiracy theories. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That's that's very strange and as for the sand woman thing, yeah, I really, I am not sure about that. My only thought would be, did he just recreate a sand woman to hump in the sand? <laughs> but <laughs> maybe we'll do, uh, maybe I'll do some digging when we're done with this episode and see if I can find anything else. But about what that. point would he have to recreate a sand woman? Is he just that that's why damn part of lonely? Me is like, because maybe it's right this... after he was with a woman. Well, that's why I'm thinking maybe the whole thing was in his head. He's so broken that his subconscious like creates this whole alternate universe. I don't know. That's probably going too deep. Is he in the Twilight <laughs> Zone? That's the real question. <laughs> <laughs> Yikes. Freddie, what are you doing, man? Yeah. So I don't know. This movie is definitely it's interesting. Like I said, mixed feelings. A lot of people and Paul Thomas Anderson himself say this is their the favorite of his films. I would not mm -hmm. agree with that statement. But I mean, if PTA is really proud of it and it's his favorite, then let him have it. <laughs> I think PTA probably says that because it took him over 12 years to produce this so but like come on look at his other stuff how can boogie nights not be not be a favorite it's so good <laughs> yeah paul thomas anderson's library of films is just ecstatic with the quality of yeah. films he produces yeah i mean boogie nights amazing magnolia Great. There will be blood. So good. Phantom Thread. You haven't seen that one yet, but I need to get you to watch it. That's also a great one. He has another movie coming out this year. Yeah. Um. If you haven't watched the entire library of Paul Thomas Anderson's films, uh, just put it in your to-do list because he's a fantastic director mm -hmm. and it's just... Well, and writer. I mean, yeah, if you really and writer. Like... I mean, we could go on, but to continue with The Master where uh where we where we left off it's just with this movie there's a lot of questions to be raised yeah there are many questions to be raised because what is going on that's the biggest question yeah i don't know if we want to kind of go into reviews already but i have a review that kind of fits along with this conversation yeah, we're having I, I would love to hear it yeah so it's actually roger our, our best guy roger ebert <laughs> so he gave the movie two and a half stars and i have a quote from it that I think kind of fits in really well with this. So he says, the master is fabulously well acted and crafted, but when I reach for it, my hand closes on air. It has rich material and it isn't clear what it thinks about it. it as two performances of Oscar caliber, but, but do they connect? 
Its title character is transparently inspired by L. Ron Hubbard, founder of Scientology, but it sidesteps any film vision of the cult religion itself or what it grew into. Yeah, absolutely. Grasping for air. I yeah. think that terminology right there is definitely how I felt watching this movie. Uh, not as if the movie is bad either. It's no, just kind well, that's of like, what we're saying. Like, the acting's amazing, and the, it is a great film, but at the end of the day, you're like, what is this movie? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What is it? You know, that's what it comes down to, and I don't have an answer for that, I think, which is why I have mixed feelings about it, and which is why I would say it is not my favorite PTA movie. It's like reading a book, and you know where you're going from point A to point B, and then if The Master was a book, and you start at point A, and then you drive to point Z, and then you go back <laughs> to point B, and then somehow end up at point q or something right yeah what do you feel adam what is your opinion about how this stacks up with some other pta movies i i don't think this is at all in line with other paul thomas anderson films in terms of you know when i watch other paul thomas anderson films i do know the direction of the storyline and i do understand what the character's motives are and i think i can follow along very very well and I could list off, you know, other Paul Thomas Anderson films and very well know what the characters are, where the story is going. And, you know, if I were to say, oh, Punch Drunk Love or something like that, I know what Adam Sandler's character is like. I know what other supporting characters he's interested in and who he's not interested in and what's going on. And I know as I watch the movie, I can kind of tell where that movie is going mm -hmm. um same with boogie nights um i watch that movie i'm on the edge of my seat as i watch it because i understand what mark Wahlberg's character is feeling as i watch it i can follow his emotions and what his character's intent is as i watch the movie this movie it's just a map of confusion because yeah. it's like i understand what Joaquin Phoenix's character, Freddie Quayle, is like, or at least I like to think I do, but at the same time, it's psychologically very much all over the place because yeah. it's like, I don't know if this is real or not. Right. And Maybe that's also, why Paul it, Thomas Anderson likes it so much because it is very open-ended. Yeah. Like, I don't know if this is a real story. I don't know if it's a fake story. I don't know if it's supposed to be in present day or in the past because we're talking with a cult leader here who's well, like reminisce in the past, reminisce now. Oh, yeah. You mean the past life thing? I was like, yeah. the movie's definitely set in the 50s because it's post World War Two. Oh, well, yes. I, but I, yeah, I, I but I get that. what you're saying. Like the, the bringing up the idea of past lives and things like that. <gasps> well, that could connect with your idea. Oh, my that God. Maybe... Adam, that you just made me click in my mind. Maybe it, it's not a like his subconscious creating an alternate universe. We're just seeing a glimpse into a past life or something. Oh man. Do, 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 do. <laughs> I'm like, I'm over here freaking out now. <laughs> so maybe it's a past life from uh, before he was in the Navy. Well, no, cause he talks about being in the Navy. Cause he says he's like a, a Navy man, a boat man. A yeah. That wouldn't man. make sense. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. We got to think about this more. I think we're getting somewhere, though. <laughs> we'll work on the treasure map and keep everyone yeah, posted. We'll get, we'll get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, For, we didn't talk about our favorite website. Our favorite website? Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, OK. <laughs> Not that that's really important, but it kind of goes along the lines of how I was saying a lot of people and Paul Thomas Anderson himself think this is like his best work. And it does have an 84 percent critic score which is, I think, pretty high. But then the audience score is only 62%. So I think a lot of the audience maybe agrees with what we've been saying. Yeah, I 100% I agree with that. Anywho, sorry to butt in there. We can go back to where you were going. Well, I think it's that time we do our <laughs> slurps up or slurps down for our first time listeners. Slurps up means we think this is a good movie. We would suggest it to other people to view and we 
think that we would watch it more and more times again and again and slurps down means that we don't think it's a good movie we do not recommend this movie and we think that we should burn it with laser vision um laura what do you think slurps up or slurps down can i give it a slurp sideways you you can okay you can do that i'm gonna say sideways i'll explain so i i would never turn down anything done by pta or psh right philip seymour yeah psh philip seymour hoffman i think he's a great actor everything he does is great and paul thomas anderson is amazing everything he does is great i'm happy i watched this movie once but i can honestly say i have no desire to ever watch this movie again once was enough for me so that's why sideways like if you if you're not a fan of the vibe and the aura of Paul Thomas Anderson movies, then this probably isn't your thing. You know, you do not need to watch this. I give you permission. Go watch Boogie Nights instead. <laughs> go watch Magnolia instead. You know, go watch some of his other stuff. But I mean, I won't say I'm happy I watched this once. I, it was a good movie, but I will not watch it again. I do not think it's a rough opinion, but that's what I'm sticking with. What about you, Adam? Up or down? You know, I've heard the term in past episodes, so I gave you permission for the slurp sideways. And I think I'm going to have to go on the same tier, the slurp sideways. It's just a thing that I'm going to do for this episode. And (laughs) I also agree with you on the slurp sideways, just because from a technical standpoint, um, a directorial standpoint, an acting Mm -hmm. standpoint, everything Mm -hmm. on the technical side, and because this is a Paul Thomas Anderson flick, you know, um, Paul Thomas Anderson did a wonderful job with this movie, and I think the movie overall, it looks great, the acting, everything I just said, it is just wonderful. Yeah. However, in terms of an audience perspective watching this movie with the storyline and everything like that. And I'm not even saying that the writing is bad necessarily. No, no. Watching this movie uh, from front to back. And when the movie was over, I personally think compared to the many other Paul Thomas Anderson films that I've watched, this movie, unfortunately in my mind is probably near the bottom of the pack just because I just don't think it, it all adds up to me. I just don't Mm -hmm. think what I got out of this movie really makes the sense that I I wanted to. I just don't think it really makes complete sense. You heard from me and Laura. We are really trying to understand what this movie means at all. If, if, if it makes sense in any way, shape or form completely, we're trying to understand Freddie Quell's character and Lancaster Dodd as they make sense to one another in this movie. What is the complete story of this film? I don't think either one of us completely understand the answer to that question. And because of that, I I can't say this is really my favorite Paul Thomas Anderson film. But does that mean Paul Thomas Anderson is a bad director or writer? Oh, God, no. Absolutely not. He's like one of my top. Yes. I'm very excited for his movie that's coming out this year. Have you looked into it any and all, Adam? I don't think so yet. So I think it's coming out in November. Yeah, November. It's called Licorice Pizza. And it already sounds good. (laughs) It follows a high school student who becomes an actor in the 1970s. And like the cast for it, you're going to love this. It's got some people we really like. Ready for this? John C. Riley. We love him. (laughs) It's got Ben Stiller, Sean Penn, Christopher Walken, Bradley Cooper, Maya Rudolph, who is Paul Thomas Anderson's partner. So obviously she's got to be in it. But yeah. I think we'll look forward to that one and we'll just cross the master off our list and move on. (laughs) So moral of my story there, um, I'm giving this one the slurp sideways. If you enjoy the work of Paul Thomas Anderson, I would say just check this one out. Give it a watch. Give it your opinion and move forward from there. If you have never seen any of Paul Thomas Anderson's work, uh, check out another one of his films first and then maybe give this one a watch. And if you've listened to our review already and you've never seen this movie, maybe uh, shy away from this one. Uh, Maybe (laughs) just, you know, take some time and think about watching this. Um, Go watch Phantom Thread. Yeah, make it your call. Watch this, don't watch this. It's all on you, baby. Um, And that's what I got (laughs) to say about The Master. On that note, it's time for our solo plugs. Laura, where can we find you on the internet? 
You can find me on TikTok at Artie Lou, A-R-T-I-E-L-U. As I mentioned many, many times before, I just do book talk stuff. So if you want to see what I'm reading, some reviews, interesting things in that realm, go follow me there. Or you can follow me on Instagram at L-H-E-R-L-O-C-H-E-R. And you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and SoundCloud at Adam Meisner. I make original music. I cover music from time to time. And I will record whatever you want. For the most part, you just let me know what you want to hear. And I will record it. I love to record music. Just tell me. Tell me what you want to hear. Please. And that wraps it up for this episode of Screen Slurps. Be sure to follow us on social media at Screen Slurps on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And be sure to listen to us on Spotify, Ghana, or just about any other podcast streaming service out there. And if you enjoy what you hear, slide on over to Apple Podcasts and give us a five-star rating. It will help us a lot. And if there's any crazy movies that you want to hear about, let us know. Leave a comment on one of our social media pages, and trust me when I say we will be sure to talk about it. So closing out, I'm Adam Meisner. I'm Laura Herlocker. Slurps up, and we will catch you later. Laters. Laters, baby.